power is solid, the boards are recapped, and now it's time to get into the messy part, the tape path. Every roller, guide, and head in this machine is coated in decades of oxide, sticky shed debris, and a bit of mystery gunk from the last session that ran through here long before we ever got our hands on it. But have no fear, I've had my shots. We're gonna strip it all down, scrape off that ugly wax buildup, polish the heads, clean the guides, and restore that mirror finish that keeps half-inch tape gliding perfectly through its path of excellence. It's a slow process, equal parts of patience, chemistry, therapy, and patience. Once you hear the result, you'll know why it's worth every cotton swab. I've got to get in there and literally scour the, uh, the flywheel, the tape path, guides, heads, and all that kind of stuff and probably going to break out the Dremel for that and use a polishing wheel in order to just get all of that crap off of those heads. And that's due probably in large part to somebody, including somebody bearing a striking resemblance to myself, uh, was running some very old stock of half-inch tape through here just to see what the tensions were being and whether or not it was going to behave even remotely close to right. And, you know, having run that old sticky shed tape through there, it contaminated everything. Also, this guide right up underneath here, where the tape comes actually behind this, comes off goes behind here and then around and then down through the actual tape path. So this is going to have all kinds of crap on the backside because it actually holds tension on the tape when it's threaded. Record head, play head, and the erase head. These are merely tape guides that are supposed to keep the tape in alignment. This is a roller with bearings in there. which is behaving fairly well, but it's filthy. These are the lifters, okay, which are typically only in contact with the tape when it's in shuttle mode, fast forward or rewind, okay? Otherwise, they're pulled out of the way by the solenoid for the pinch roller. So these guides are alignment guides for the tape path. These are the lifters. Anything the tape comes in contact with has to be cleaned. Look, Simba. Everything the tape touches is cleaned. Wow. And it's got to be done, I mean, impeccably clean. All right. Otherwise, you damage the tape, you affect your recording, and your reputation goes down the tubes. What's going on here is I'm just, I'm showing you the condition of everything prior to my getting involved. All right. Showed you the tape path and the heads. And what I have here, that's the cap stand. I'm just gonna, you know, spin that manually. It's not gonna wanna go very far because of the belt that's on there and so forth. And I can't quite reach in behind there. But the condition of this is just horrendous. Also, the pinch roller, well, it actually looks like it's got a couple of divots in it. We're gonna just fully replace that. A funky pinch roller is gonna affect the tape path performance, so I'm not going to really rely on whatever readings and performance I get with that particular pinch roller. One other thing I wanna point out is right down here, that's the playhead, all right? Record heads in front of it. Well, this right here is called the exit guide, and it performs the most important alignment prior to getting pulled through the capstan and pinch roller. If this is even remotely out of tolerance, it's going to affect how the tape actually attacks the heads when it's in motion. And this has to be absolutely perfect. This is the entrance guide. This is the exit guide. These two have got to be perfectly aligned. This one does most of the work. And finally, this is the take up tension arm spring loaded it's got the switch in there which basically controls the actual functions if the tape were to end or break or something like that the tension takes that off there's an internal switch back there that basically disables the tape run function the brakes immediately engage and it stops the tape in in hopes of protecting your tape from whatever stupid button got pushed let's see if i can't get some loose stuff off and make the the bigger job easier loud. Ordinarily, I use a clean 
swab. This this isn't just oxide coming off here. This is debris. Let's take a moment and talk about what we're really fighting when we clean tape heads. Magnetic tape runs across the head at around 15 inches per second. Hopefully it is 15 inches per second, but we'll get into that another time. And it's not just oxide that's on there. As the binder ages, it sheds adhesive, dust, and all sorts of microscopic junk that clogs the head gaps. Those gaps are microscopic. What it takes to diminish their performance is equally microscopic. When you clean the heads and you can see the crap coming off of them, that's called a tell in the business. Each gap on a multi-track head, or any tape head for that matter, is less than the width of a human hair divided by 50. It doesn't take much contamination to block that signal. And when it does, you lose clarity, you lose level, and sometimes an entire track. Contamination affects playback the worst, and when it's bad enough, the recording suffers too. God, I can feel the debris on there. When you're cleaning, use high percentage isopropyl alcohol. At 6R, we use reagent alcohol. It's a better solvent with the least residue. Wipe the gap vertically, perpendicular to the tape motion and never use anything abrasive unless you're intentionally polishing. And if you ever wonder how clean is clean, when the swab comes away spotless three times in a row, you're there. Sticky shed tape left residue all over the rollers and guides. So I'm working through each one with alcohol and elbow grease. The pinch roller is shot, divots and all, so we'll replace it later. But for now, I'm cleaning everything the tape comes in contact with. When the new roller arrives, we calibrate. Even the exit guide alignment matters here. If it's even slightly off, the tape hits the heads at an angle. Every fixture the tape touches needs to be spotless and true. Somebody was probably wanted to play that back and ingest it, just dub it into some kind of a digital workstation and the tapes are like, you know, you're going to get one pass out of them and then, you know, they're going to be just totally destroyed. You know, using a deck like this to transfer, you know, eight track masters and so forth. I get it, but what it's going to do to the deck itself, you know, just contaminating it. And you, you got to go through a total cleaning before you do another person's tape, you know, stuff like that. I mean, it, it's going to get ugly. Those tapes, they want to preserve them. I get it, but... You do the work for somebody, you do the ingest. When you bill them, you better factor in what it's gonna take to clean that deck after one pass. And I am still getting debris out of these corners. For my money, I'd probably charge them for a manicure afterwards. Cause what this is doing to my fingernails and Somebody's gonna pay. Let's just take a look at this. You know, what I'm also seeing though is there is a bunch of scoring where the tape has basically scored the flange. I mean, one way to sort of, you know, evaluate a tape deck is to look at the heads themselves and see how badly worn they are to the point of having them lapped. Another way to just confirm that is to look at any scoring that may be, you know, caused by the tape edge just playing through there, cutting a groove in there. This one looks like it might have a fairly sizable groove cut in it, but with all the reflection with the lights and stuff like that, I can't be sure. Actually, I think it might just be reflection, but I see scoring in these other guides. See, I'm still getting all of this stuff out of there. Seem to have come clean that time. Tech tip, toothpaste is known to be a very, very mild abrasive. And I'm going to go ahead and apply some of this 
to a head. And then I'm going to use the Dremel. Now, the thing about it is, is I could put this on the Dremel head, but because it's spinning, centrifugal force, it's going to be spraying all over the place. So what I want to do is simply apply it to a head. I'm going to start with the record head. Eh, pretty much dead center, but not a heck of a lot. And then see where we end up. I even think I'm going to go ahead and just apply a drop of alcohol on here. I want to go ahead and slow this down and apply as little torque as possible. And we'll see what that looks like. Much more shiny. I think it could use one more pass. But I'm going to consider this polishing wheel done. And the heads are minty fresh. And it makes you wonder, what the heck is it pulling off of there? Rinse. <laughs> now spit. So now that I'm satisfied that the tape path is clean enough, actually pristine cleanliness uh, before I was actually going to run that alignment tape through there. So now that I'm satisfied that that's done, I'm prepared now to actually put this tape to its use. And in order to accomplish that, um, one of the things that I prefer to do, not everybody does this, but this is an alignment tape. So I don't want to shuttle it through the tape path just to rewind it because it's wound tails out. So what I want to do is I'm just going to shuttle the tape to the beginning so that I can run it through here. But to save wear and tear on the tape, I don't want it passing through there really fast. So um, just going to apply a little bit of friction up here and get it back to the beginning. Okay, so I'm in playback mode. All of my record ready switches are off to avoid any accidental damage. You ever notice how damage sounds a lot like damn it? MRL calibration tape, IEC equalization at 355 nanoweapons per meter, fringing compensated. One kilohertz. All meters except track three are just a hair above three dB. Okay. Which I would expect for a 355 nanoweber per meter alignment tape. This deck is no doubt set up for 250 nanowebers, which it can't buy a recording tape in that stock anymore. 250 is just not to be had. So 
In fact, in, in discussions, we're probably going to end up purchasing 320 stock, which is actually, because of the way this was aligned, is only going to be a difference of about 1 dB. So 320 over 250 is about plus 1 dB. So the meters will actually be plus 1 as opposed to plus 3.5, right? But that's not the issue I'm seeing here. Track 3 is low. All the rest of them, playback mode, it's down about 4.5 dB, which is a difference of 8 dB when you figure the plus 3.5 to the minus 4.5. Uh, let's see what else. Switching to the record mode, head in sync mode, channel 8 dropped out altogether, but channel 3 is plus 3.5. So the record head here is good. But channel eight is not showing up. 10 kilohertz. 10 kilohertz, playback mode. Three is still low. The rest of these tracks are pretty much pinned. That's just an equalization alignment. You know, we can fix that later. But channel three is now down seven dB from what, plus five on these meters, just by the looks of it. Channel 8 is still out on the uh, record head, but the rest of these, in fact, I've even got overload lights, so these are probably set for plus 4. And that's just, you know, with this playback right now, I'll get that all tweaked at some point. But I'm concerned now that 16 the... 16 kilohertz. 16 kilohertz, wow. That, that is impressive. That is really impressive. Okay, channel 8 is still out. That's the playback head. This one's a little bit low, but that's an EQ adjustment. But channel three in playback is just, it's not happy. And I believe that the last test tone that's going to be on here is 50 hertz. We'll wait for Mr. Announcer. Talk to me, big bro. Come on, Mr. L. Get it? M-R-L. Mr. L. Okay. 50 hertz. Okay, playback mode. Three is it's higher than it was at 1K. The rest of these are, you know, 3 dB or a little bit more. And eight is still out in the record head. I'm guessing that's probably a relay not switching. But the rest of these are nice and stable. I'm impressed. I am, I am very, very impressed. So we'll let that tape run out. A couple of things. Got to figure out what's going on with channel three's playback head and channel eight in the record mode altogether. So I don't know. We'll uh, we'll start that investigation shortly. And that's the kind of shine we want to see: freshly cleaned, aligned, and ready for the calibration tones. The next step, we'll load an MRL alignment tape, verify each track's playback level, and then start dialing in the EQ and bias. It's a ritual every analog tech knows by heart. Clean, align, calibrate, repeat. And it's the difference between just pretty and one that you want to take home to meet mom.